Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Turvey. I'm president and executive director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's JTalks live webcast is Climate Solutions Journalism, The Solution, presented in partnership with Intact Financial. Our thanks to Intact for helping us shed light on the vital importance of climate reporting. And thank you to the journalists, students, editors, and members of the public joining us across the country for this conversation exploring how newsrooms can best tell the defining story of our time. We're grateful for the continued generosity of our exclusive JTalk series sponsor, TD Bank Group, for supporting our programs year round. Thanks also to our in-kind supporter, Cision, and to CPAC, our broadcast partner for this event. If you enjoy these talks and would like to support the work of the CJF, you can donate now or make us part of your holiday giving at any time by visiting our website. As always, I have a few CJF previews to share with you. Our next event takes place tomorrow. At 6.30 p.m. Eastern, we'll join renowned journalists Connie Walker and Lydia Polgreen for an intimate conversation about the state of media and the future of news on both sides of the border. While the in-person event is sold out, you can still sign up to join us for the free live stream. And later this month, the CJF is hosting an interactive online workshop for candidates applying for the CJF CBC Indigenous Journalism Fellowships. Past Indigenous Journalism Fellow and CBC storyteller Leonard Monkman will join us to share his insights on how to craft compelling winning story pitches. Before we begin our program, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of the lands that we are on today. While we meet on a virtual platform, we would like to take a moment to recognize the importance of the land that we each call home. The Canadian Journalism Foundation's office is situated on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and we are privileged to live and work in these territories. A reminder, today's program is an hour long and you can su still submit your questions for our speakers at any time via the tab on your screen. Extreme weather patterns around the world have brought new urgency to the need to connect audiences to the climate story. You only have to look to this past summer where 98% of the world's population experienced higher temperatures and last month was the hottest October globally since records began. As the climate emergency deepens and at a time of news avoidance, we need to look at new directions. How can newsrooms create compelling climate journalism that connects with audiences and provokes positive change? Climate solutions journalism has been one tactic, but is it working? Our panelists today bring a wealth of global perspectives and insights to these questions. Joining us from Edinburgh, Diego Arguedas Ortiz is the Associate Director at the Oxford Climate Journalism Network of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. From Guelph, we're joined by Dr. Annabella Bonada. She's the manager of the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation at the University of Guelph. From British Columbia, reporter Stephanie Wood is a member of the Narwhal team that received the 2023 CGF Award for Climate Solutions Reporting. And in San Francisco, Mark Hertzgard is the co-founder and executive director of Covering Climate Now and the environment correspondent for the nation. Mark has covered climate change since 1989 from 25 countries. This panel is skillfully guided by our esteemed moderator. Also in BC, Laura Lynch is the host of CBC's What on Earth and the inaugural recipient of the CJF Award for Climate Solutions Reporting. On behalf of the CJF, we are so honored to have all of you with us today. Laura, over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie, and welcome to everyone. And I speak to you from Vancouver, the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Uh, just uh, want to get started by telling everybody how we're going to do this. So we're just going to launch into a conversation because the people that are joining me today have lots of experience and lots of things to share. And after about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, we'll be turning to audience questions. So uh, send them in. As you know, you still can. And we'll try to get to some of them anyway. I'm not sure how many we'll be able to get to. Uh, I'm just going to start by saying, um, so what on earth launched just over three years ago. And at that point, we weren't even sure it was gonna be anything more than a summer series. Um, and the 
inevitable happened. The, the story became bigger and bigger and people understood just how critical it is. And we're now a permanent part of the schedule. And in those three years, I've seen so much growth in climate reporting. There are so many others getting into this field, realizing that this is the story of our day. And so I'm happy to be surrounded by so many other people, including the people here today. So I think I want to start by asking all of you to sort of define climate solutions reporting, because I think there are different definitions of it. And Mark, because you're the, the senior uh, correspondent when it comes to this subject, let's start with you. Thanks, Laura, and uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for, for being here. This is really important, and thanks to everybody in the audience. Uh, you know, this is not a spectator sport, saving the planet, and so today is a big part of that. And solutions journalism, I think, is key to that. Uh, you know, Laura mentioned I've been covering this story for a long time, so I'm old enough to remember when there was basically climate silence throughout the mainstream media. And not just in Canada, not just in the United States, both of which are petro states, of course, but in most of the world. And if there is silence, that means that the general public is not really aware of what's going on. And when you've got a situation where this problem is driven by the fossil fuel industry, which is arguably the richest, most powerful economic enterprise in human history that has very strong political power, the only way to overcome that is with people power and with people being informed. So journalism itself, I think, is a climate solution. Um, more and better coverage of the climate story is an essential climate solution, because until people understand what's happening, why it's happening, and that it can be fixed, in fact, that they are instrumental to fixing it by electing different leaders and changing their buying uh, habits, uh, we're not going to fix this. So uh, solutions journalism, particularly, we are careful at covering climate now. We're a global collaboration of over 600 news outlets around the world that reach billions of people in their uh, radio, TV, uh, digital, and print forms. So uh, we are not activists, and we are journalists, and we have a different role but so we are careful to say that solutions journalism is not activism and it is not cheerleading. And above all, it does not sugarcoat. But what it does do, and this is a break from traditional journalism, it tells the whole story, the entire story, not just what's wrong, but how it might be fixed. That's telling the whole story. And traditionally, media has focused on what's wrong, and we have basically left how to fix it to civil society to government policymakers, et cetera. And at Covering Climate Now, we believe, along with our colleagues at the Solutions Journalism Network, who have taught us a lot about this, um, that real solutions reporting looks at the entire problem. What's wrong, how to fix it, and we interrogate potential solutions. You interrogate as a reporter, does that solution make sense or not? And so we think that our civic role there is to inform policymakers and the public, general public alike, here's a, a climate solution that seems to work. Here's one that doesn't seem to work. Here's another that we don't know yet. We need to do more reporting. That is what we consider to be climate solutions uh, reporting that is rigorous and civic minded. Diego, what do you think of that? I mean, it's the same page. No, I think what we need is to get better at saying what's missing. In like, this is sort of a power, right? So we have, or actually, this like decades long uh, tradition of like, of feels like obs obfuscating like the truth about um, climate change and why it's happening. What I think we should be trying to do right now is try to narrow down what we mean with like better journalism about climate change. I think for me, a key part is like, what what our audience needs on for from us as reporters right and i think a key part of that is making it feel local and relevant and for me unless you you work for like up the, like the biggest brands of the world like bbc and movies of the world we need to start thinking how can you make journalism more relevant for like local audiences everywhere in the world and um that can be locally as your um geographical a region you can be locally as your like topic an example of this is like um one of our members of the network 
uh, uh, Hava Gurriere from the commercial server in the US, she writes for real estate publication. And they do the best journalism about real estate in the world. And it, it's it's really it's really striking. Like you can find your niche and your audience, and you can talk some specific to to like the people who need to know about this. I think we've been for a long time sort of like sh sh like firing the average story about climate change in, jour in journalism, and we need to start like narrowing down what our audience actually needs. Um, this might be mean different things for different parts of the world. Um, this might mean different things for different languages as well. And it's something we can explore in the chat. But I think for me, like, start, I think everyone in Spanish agrees, like, we need better country journalism. Like, how do we do that? I think it's like the key question that will move the industry from like now to like the next 10 years and see how we actually transform or not the journalism we see right now. Can I, can I just follow up with you for just a sec though, Diego? When you, can you give an example of what you mean by relevance in a local context? Um, yeah, I'm actually going to take um, Stephanie's uh, Narwhal publication. So they they published a newsletter, I think, last year for the elections on climate change and politics, um, which I thought was brilliant. It was like a short, like a short um, series of newsletters that really took an issue that was local for the, their audience. It was elections in Canada. Um, I think it was Ontario, one of the, like, the local elections. And it really drove down the topic of like, this is something my audience needs in my country, in my region. And for me, that is, um, that really adds value as a journalism industry that is not found elsewhere. So I think if we manage to crack that, I think just there's something there that we can start moving the needle as a journalist that we're not being able to right now. Okay, well, there you got your uh, endorsement there, Stephanie, for the number <laughs> Um is, is that what you th think climate solutions journalism is? Good climate solutions journalism is, is that example? And maybe you could talk about it just a little bit more. Yeah, thanks for pointing to that, Diego. I think that is a really great example, the newsletter that my colleagues led. Um, and so, yeah, I think I would build off a lot of what um, has already been said but I do agree that one of the points I've, I'm always thinking about and that we're thinking about at the Narwhal is um, bringing issues to down to the really, really local level, because that is what um, solutions really look like. If you just ask the question, how are we going to solve climate change? Like it's really a question that is impossible to answer because getting down to every single um, waterway and every city um, and every heat wave and all of that stuff, it, it takes you down to a local level. Um, and I think that that is also a way to address the issue of news avoidance that we mentioned at the top. A lot of the time, the stories that do get like a lot of direct engagement and a lot of reads will be stories that are hyper local, ones that you wouldn't necessarily expect to blow up the way that they do. Um, we And we find that that is a way to really, really engage with people and really illustrate what solutions can look like. Like one of the stories um, that we submitted for the Climate Solutions Award was looking at the efforts to restore the Squamish estuary um, and really breaking down the work that went into the actual restoration, but also just getting all the different um, parts of the community on the same page, like the Squamish nation, which is my nation, and then the kite borders and council and the feds and like just literally a big part of the story was just how do we get all these local groups to work together and, um, you know, like share priorities. And so, yeah, I really agree with Diego that um, keeping things local is a way to engage people and also just to make solutions feel doable and tangible and be able to understand them. Thank you. That raises some really interesting questions that I hope we'll get to. But first, I want Annabella to, to weigh in because you're you're not a journalist per se. And so I just wonder if you could reflect on what, what you think climate ju ju solutions journalism is or should be and what, it, it, what how is it most effective? Yeah, I think um, everybody covered excellent points. Uh, Mark, I appreciate so much that you've been able to see the change in journalism from climate not really being there to informing the public on the issues to really changing it to solutions. Uh, so I work for the Intech Center on Climate Adaptation. So climate adaptation 
is that it's finding solutions um, at the very local level, as uh, Stephanie and Diego are, are speaking about, but also at a bigger scale, like watershed community. Um, so we really focus on solutions. We want um, communities and residents to feel empowered in the face of climate change and have actions that they can do to increase their resilience. Um, so we've seen in journalism a huge change just over the past few years on the solutions. We know there's a problem we're kind of tired of hearing scientists talk about it and tell us and climate is an issue, but what can we do about it? Um, so uh, solutions journalism absolutely has a place in this and we've all seen the effects of that. Um, I'm sure you've all followed like the, the green belt situation in Ontario over the past year. And it was journalists who brought that to the forefront and then Ontarians who said, we're proud of the green belt. We, we want to sustain it the way that it is. And all of that creating activity and movement and actually leading to a favorable outcome. Uh, so yes, so the solutions that journalism is bringing forth are absolutely necessary to tackle the biggest issue that we have globally. That's an interesting point because um, you you talked about something that that somewhat local in Ontario that actually resulted in governmental institutional change being made, and I I'm just wanting to throw this out to all of you in in that effort to be local and be relevant or empower people to to take it upon themselves to make differences. Do you miss trying to? to make change or uh, influence change at an institutional, at a corporate, at a government level? Who would like to tackle that? Let, let, let me start there because I think Annabella's point about adaptation like resiliency is for me core of, of a different kind of journalism around the world, especially in countries and parts of the world with like, say like lower per capita carbon emissions, right? If, if you go to a community in, I don't know, Panama, Ghana, the the way to do climate engagement and climate um, empowerment will be likely adaptation, right? These are communities that would not have high footprints and will need to just start thinking about like how to make my home and my community more resilient. Then I think a way to start them engage, if you want, in the climate um, action, if you want, like ladder, will be to begin with a stories about adaptation in their communities that can they can relate to. Um, and this might be, if you want, like a gateway action to then later on think about like, hey, if we if I can start making my community safer by having better waterways and manage better the wetlands, later in the future, maybe I can start engaging like with communities, with the municipality, with the, with the government, because the issue, I think, with citizens, people like me that maybe don't, I mean, we don't necessarily do every, every day kind of actions, it's like, it's hard to know where to start. But if the media is showing that you can start with small stuff in adaptation, maybe there's a way forward that we can show the ways. And I, I think we, as journalists, we have, I have, for a long time, had a bias towards mitigation actions. Um, that is being, I guess, I guess addressed. But if, if we can do more adaptation and community resilience stories, I think there's a way forward as well. Okay, I did, just in case people who are, are tuned in here don't understand the, all of the terms that are being um, thrown out here because we, we live in this world and we know what it all means. <laughs> Mitigation is essentially talking about ways to cut emissions um, and cut greenhouse gases. Adaptation is learning how to or adjusting the ways that you live to deal with the fallout of climate change. So that's what we're talking about here. Does anyone else want to pick up on this idea that perhaps a, a hyper local or a local focus lets the big guys, the corporate players, the governments off the hook? Mark. Sure, I think, you know, we have to do both. And the we talk about the media, but the media is a multi, multi, multi-bodied uh, beast. And thank goodness, right? So there's locally oriented uh, outlets and there's nationally and there's internationally. So uh, I think we definitely have to do both. At Covering Climate Now, we urge our uh, colleagues in journalism to, uh, when you're covering climate change, in order to break through the the resistance, the news fatigue, et cetera, the, the, the gloom and doom aspect is you must humanize the story. So talk about people, uh, talk about parts per million. You must localize to the extent that you can talk about situations that people themselves can relate to. And you must solutionize, which of course we know is not a proper verb, but you get my <laughs> meaning. 
So I think that we can do all of these things and uh, different parts of the media will do all of those things. And it's very important as, uh, as we approach this, not to think that there's one way only that is gonna fix this. There is no one solution to climate change. There's a lot of different solutions, but what they all have in common is that people have to get involved. And sometimes those of us who are in, you know, you just mentioned, Laura, that, you know, we're all in this world. So we know terms like mitigation and adaptation. Um, you know, most of the public does not. Most of the public still does not realize that the scientists are 99% uh, in agreement about climate change. People don't know that. And so we have to meet people where they are. And sometimes that means real climate 101. And I quite agree with what Diego said that, uh, you know, one way to do that is to talk about adaptation at your own home uh, region. But if we stop there, we're going to miss the point, because unless we vote out of office, the government officials who are now sending us over the cliff and vote into office, the government officials who will steer a different path, doesn't matter what you do locally. You know, the, the big boys, and we're going to have a meeting later this month, the COP28 Global Climate Summit in the United Arab Emirates, um, that is going to make big decisions about all this. So we've got to be able to do both, I think, local and global at the same time. Okay. Anyone else want to pick up on that? Can I just say yeah, something? Please go ahead, Sorry. Annabelle. Uh, just quickly for, for Mark. So I think you you kind of covered everything saying media is is everything. It's it's such a large body. So you're able to actually do all of that. Um, so we absolutely need mitigation. We absolutely need adaptation. We need local. We need global because it's affecting everybody. And that is the beauty of the giant media. Um, so what we do at, at the center as well is just get our resources across Canada using you guys as outlets. So we we contact the media, we get our resources to Canadians, but we're also big on writing op-eds that we hope will go directly to the decision makers, to the policy um, makers. Um, and we also reach out to corporations constantly. So even at that adaptation file and point, we're um, engaging residents, we're engaging municipalities, we're engaging different levels of government and we go with corporations the ones that are op open to receiving us and then we kind of poke at the ones that are not that open yet but uh it's a multifaceted solutions need to come from everywhere and at, and at all the scales so i agree on that um i just also want to mention and this sort of goes to what mark was saying that because media is not monolithic the the, the solutions reporting is only part of the puzzle that there's obviously a place for great investigative reporting and it doesn't necessarily have to have a solution attached to it um, it is something unto itself and and it's certainly we're not suggesting that that should be excluded from consideration when you're doing climate reporting um but i i, I wonder um when it comes to uh the solutions side of things um stephanie i wonder if you can give me some other examples of what your publication has done because uh, i from my own experience Sometimes solutions can be um, viewed too narrowly in terms of technical solutions. Are there other subjects that come into that space? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I think that one thing that we really do try to do is um, whenever, even when you do do a more local or specific story, still trying to connect it to the bigger picture. Um, and that might be federal policy or just like broader movements, but always trying to bring it, um, do that whole pyramid focus in and you bring it out. And um, I think that that's something that we kind of focus on doing for a lot of stories. So I think one story in particular that kind of comes to mind was um, we did a story looking back at how the um, original protests in Kirkwood Sound actually transformed the region. It was right when the Fairy Creek stuff first kind of popped up and became a bit of a national story and everyone was referring back to the last time there was a mass arrest in the 90s. And then we wanted to look at, you know, how did forestry um, actually change after that? Like, you know, the kind of like everyone looked away after the protest. And then so we did a really deep dive into looking at how the nations um, that were leading those protests took over the forestry license um, and that that was actually a really big struggle and that they had to be working to now meet all of these expectations to log because now they have 
they're facing rent and fees and all these obligations to make money off of forestry. Well, but their ultimate goal is, is to save old growth. So that's a really specific hyper local yeah. example, right? But we, yeah. like, it, it was a gateway to talk about um, exactly those issues that are at the provincial level and on an issue that actually has national interest as well, which is um, old growth forests. And so it's so local. It's a very specific event that a lot of people don't even like necessarily remember, <laughs> but it led us to being able to talk about these broader issues around, you know, like how these um, licensing, how this licensing works and what is selective logging, what is sustainable logging um, and what does it look like and what difference has it made and what are its limitations? Um, it just be became a gateway to talk about all of those broader issues. I kind of think of, uh, of climate solutions reporting as being about everything. So I, for anyone out there watching or listening, I would suggest that you think of it very broadly. Almost any topic can become a climate solutions topic if you take the time to, to put it in that context and think about what an answer to it might be. And that goes all the way from the courts. We know there's a lot of court cases that are, are uh, evolving in terms of challenges to governments on climate. Uh, finance, pensions, banking, um, culture, is part of it as well. And that sort of brings me around to a topic I'm not sure that many of you get yourselves involved in, but is there a place for humor when it comes to climate solutions reporting? Anybody God, want to? Yeah. Oh, there's, there's a smile coming out there. We like that. <laughs> you said God, yes, Mark? <laughs> God, yes. And, and I mean, look, speaking as I'm basically a writer, I spent most of my career writing books and I am, uh, Clear enough about my own abilities as a writer. As a writer, I know I'm not a funny writer. Uh, the people who can be funny on the page, God bless them. They're they're the best. And uh, you know, as readers, we all know we gravitate to that. So humor is definitely something, and not just humor, uh, but human human interest stories and other ways in to the climate space for our not just our readers, but let's remember most people are. Um, get their news. Uh, you'll like this, Laura. Most people get their news from broadcasting, from TV and radio around the world. And so the more that we can bring in not just humor, but music and art and the full panoply of human experience into our journalism and our presentation of this, remember what we fundamentally are, are storytellers. And telling stories is how humans process reality, how we live the world. If we tell one, how was your day, dear? Or how was school today, honey? You know, those are stories. And so the more we think about it in that way as uh, our, our work, as opposed to, gee, what did the government minister say today? And how do we report that responsibly? What a snooze, right? <clears throat> Let's bring the full scope of our humanity to this reporting and we'll, we'll do a lot better. And one final point, you mentioned investigative, Laura. Um, I totally agree on that. And there is an amazing investigative story today that is out from our colleagues at uh, Covering Climate Now, the AFP Global News Agency, that illustrates your point, Laura, that investigative can also be a solution. They, they got the receipts. AFP has shown that McKinsey, the big global consulting firm, is working behind the scenes to advise the COP28 uh, president who, you couldn't make this up, talk about humor, you couldn't make this up, this year's COP28 is headed by a oil company executive, the, the head of the national oil company at the United Arab Emirates. Behind the scenes, McKinsey is advising them to basically break all of the 1.5 degree targets to continue to increase oil and gas production on through to 2050. That is an investigative expose. I commend it to all of you. It's on AFP. It's all around the internet today. Um, but it's also a solution story because it tells us do not trust these people, right? Do not trust McKinsey. Uh, do not trust what's coming out of the uh, COP28 presidency. Uh, I mean, hear them out, but definitely check the receipts. Right. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh in on either investigative or humor or just how you you lure people into paying attention to this material because uh, people hear climate change and they don't want to hear anymore. No, I, I, I like to say to you, and I think an example is last year, uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, published uh, investigations on collagen, and I think it was uh, made uh, with support of like Rainforest Investigation Network. And what they did is like they looked at the Brazilian uh, farms that were getting 
moving a collagen from cows and figure out what's happening with this and realize a bunch of that will come from deforestation. But people who are buying collagen for like beauty products didn't know about that. And they they did like they did a big piece of research and mitigation online. And they also did like a bunch of TikTok videos with like fake influencers, it's essentially a fake ad, right? Of like this collagen is great. And I think that little reel was probably more effective at like getting new readers into the conversation that than like the big research did and the big um, splash did on on, on uh, online. So I think there's a space for this. And I agree with Mike, we take ourselves too seriously as reporters sometimes. And this is an issue overall as industry is like, how can we, like, how, how can we change the way we perceive ourselves as like this, yeah, this paladins of like truth and, and just be more funny and be more casual and formal because we you need to chat with people as we're like peers and friends. And so far, I think, I think we're really bad at that. I, I'm, I'm awful at that. Like when I write, I'm, I'm, I'm Mark, I'm not funny. Um, and there's something about that. And on investigation, I think the other the point is, I, th I think we, we haven't cracked the link between showing something as wrong and showing the way forward. And I think the classic case with this is carbon credits. So there's been a tremendous work of journalism in the past two years showing that they are mostly sc scammy or a scam, like entirely. And you see Bloomberg, um, you see Clip in Latin America, so many pieces actually doing this. But I haven't seen many good stories following up and say, okay, this is how we should do it. Um, and I think it's missing in, in this big investigation it says, so what is the way forward with carbon credits and markets? Maybe just no forward, but I, I think it's something there that we could explore more and link more properly investigations with social journalism that I think we're missing so far. That's a really good point. Um, I, th that brings me sort of to the next part of that I wanted to talk about, which is I'm assuming that among the people who are tuning in today, I'm using an old broadcast term, um, are people who are interested in getting involved in climate solutions journalism. And I wonder if we can tap into the expertise here to have all of you give them some ideas about how to get started, how to develop contacts, where to go. And Annabelle, I want to start with you because you're, you're a contact, you're a source. What would you suggest to people who are wanting to get involved? I think uh, it's a great idea to get in contact with organizations like like ours where we work um, because that's what we do. We come up with the solutions to like to some of the issues with climate. Um, so we really focus on extreme heat, flooding, and wildfire, and we've seen all of those occur um, across Canada this summer. So if you're wondering, okay, how do I create content and something that people can really respond to? Um, contact organizations like ours. Uh, our resources are all free downloadable. Um, they can be, um, sorry, sent around to anybody. Um, so the thing to remember is that the solutions do exist. It's about promoting them, about getting them in the right hands, about making them easy to understand. Uh, so that's one of our big things is creating giant reports um, that many experts contribute to, the science is there, but then from that we distill it down to infographics, for example, with easy actions, with low cost, uh, no cost, and then higher upgrades. So there's something for everybody there, something that everyone can do. Um, so yeah, my, my main suggestion is find the solutions and find ways to promote them and work with the organizations that are, that are already doing this. Okay, Stephanie, top tips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, this is another good question. At first, um, I really wanted to answer the brevity thing, so we're going to work it into the okay, answer. Okay, fine. <laughs> well, no problem. Very quickly, because I think that actually that is one thing, is I do think you should keep brevity um, in your working life. Uh, we are big fans of memes and cat videos, and um, <laughs> we do have some stories that have really nailed that light tone. Our newsletter always has a light tone, but I wanted to especially shout out my colleague, Sasha Vasayad, who did a story about these birds um, called plovers and uh, in the article referred to it as Plov Island and made it like a spoof off of the reality TV show Love Island um, and it's fantastic <laughs> and titillating <laughs> and then also my BC colleague Francesca just did a story about um, slug races and has the most amazing tone and did a video going alongside it um, but when thinking about this, I also realized that maybe like we still do it in some of our outward facing things, but one of the most important things is keeping that brevity in our newsroom. Like I work with the funniest people and I could never, ever, ever list all of the 
like jokes that have been going on for years on end <laughs> and the funny photos people share and the little bits of brevity we share from our own lives like the little things that are happening and I think that everyone would say that that's what keeps us going through the day and so it's like Fatima Syed and Emma McIntosh and Denise Falconsoon were working like so hard on the Green Belt story, this huge investigative thing that took years. And then Fatima is also writing about Club Island. So <laughs> just like I think that balance is so That's important. A, yeah, it's, it's for us too. It's not just for the for others. Us we, as well. yeah, You're gonna yeah. burn out. You're gonna burn out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then for other tips, I would say um Whenever I'm writing any story, I always am thinking of the four pillars of solutions journalism um, that uh, JHR always talks about, which is you're um, looking at a response to a problem, you're explaining how it works, you're giving insight to others on how is it possible to emulate? Like sometimes it's like not really that possible to emulate for a bunch of reasons. Um, and then what are its limitations and what is the evidence that it works? And so I'm always thinking, even if I don't write a story that necessarily hits all of those pillars every time, I ask myself those questions for every story I'm writing. Um, espe and especially if like you might notice that one of those pillars is one that you do a little bit less, like maybe you do a little bit of less of, less of the insight of how it could be applied other places. Um, maybe you really focus on the evidence, um, but don't give as much of that insight, which is also really important. Um, and then the last thing that I would say too is just, yeah, like really keeping it focused on people and the fact that, you know, like we are part of this ecosystem and this world. And but where do you, where do you find your stories as a practical um, tip for, for reporters who want to get into this? Where, where do you find them? so many different places that's such a hard question to answer like one of them was just literally a small pilot project uh, like out of the city of surrey and we're just looking at like a press release out of surrey a lot of it is building relationships with people and keeping in touch with them and then they're going to come to you with solutions the clay cut sound story was responding to a moment right there was a big moment around fairy creek we were like what can we bring to this moment you know what are people talking about right now same with like wildfires often we've done a lot of stories about solutions to um wildfires and like that is often brought about like about by the moment because that's such a huge thing once again that impacts people's lives so i think like once again kind of starting in your community and yeah. just literally looking up like what are the councils around you doing what are nonprofits doing get an idea of the lay of the land and then start trying to like build connections between things and between people i would say Hey, Mark. If you're a journalist, um, <clears throat> please come to Covering Climate Now website. We are organized by journalists for journalists, and you're all welcome. There are countless uh, resources there that will be useful to you as you're working your way either into the uh, uh, news business or uh, working your way up the business. I would say that, you know, for better or worse, the climate beat is uh, you're going to have a job for the rest of your career covering this story. And hopefully we'll be covering a lot more solutions and the problem as the years go on. So come to coveringclimatenow.org. All of our services are free. And as I say, it's fellow colleagues. Uh, we build community at that site and we invite everybody to come and uh, share their, their uh, problems and their insights and uh, their tips with one another. And it's really helpful um, to all of us in our work. <clears throat> and one final point on the humor front I forgot to mention earlier, you know, I don't think it's an accident that the single number two biggest movie in Netflix history was the climate satire, Don't Look Up, which, yeah. by the way, <clears throat> took a pretty strong swipe at um, the uh, more than occasional foolishness of uh, the TV news business. But uh, <laughs> this goes to show, again, a light touch is uh, goes a long way. Love that film. <laughs> okay, Diego, what, what about what is your ideas, tips, suggestions for what, what people starting out in the space? I just like co-sign everything that Stephanie said on like the four pillars. I think that's just like the way I would approach them as well. And that, that's essentially that. Um, and on like how to find stories, I would say just look out in the community what's not working well, what's messed up, and then see who's doing something to solve that. Usually there's someone, however small they are or big they are, trying to address that. Either a center like Anabelas or a community group or a legislator there's someone trying to address that and then examine the examine which actually works, as Stephanie said. And that would be the way I would approach, like trying to find social journalism stories on, on climate change. There's, there's so many things that are not working on our climate policies. Our communities flood, uh, forest fires, uh, lack of food in places, lack of water. There's so many things that are just not working. 
and finding someone who's actually trying to do something about that, it's, it's I think, the easiest or the, or the clearest way forward, maybe not the easiest. And once you have that, then keep a funny set of community um, engaged and just talk to people and know that you're also a person with interests and lives and, yeah, and just things roll from there. Yeah, once you get started in, the, in doing this, you'll just find yourself facing a cascade of story ideas um, that go from from very local to international, from very serious to more lighthearted. Um, and I just don't think you'd have any problem once once the ball starts rolling. The, the bigger problem is sometimes you just don't can never see the end of it and it can seem overwhelming. So that's where the humor part comes in for us as well. Um, in about five minutes, we're going to turn to uh, questions from the audience. So if you have any, you can still send them. <clears throat> excuse me. You can still um, send them in. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat. And I just want to ask now, in this space, in the climate reporting and climate solution space, what do you see of, uh, as the role of social media? Who wants to tackle that? Nobody. It's an <laughs> untouchable subject. <laughs> uh, Diego? I, I'm happy to, to oh, start. Okay. Social media is critical but it's no more critical than traditional media. Much of the news that you see on Instagram or TikTok or wherever is basically poached from or based on, let's say, what has already been reported by the traditional media. And so <clears throat> we need both. You know, I'm the uh, uh, father of an 18-year-old daughter, so, uh, you know, I don't think she has ever watched a, an appointment television news show in her life. And yet she's quite well-informed. And she gets it all off of her phone. But she uh, was not aware, even though her dad is a journalist, she wasn't aware that most of the news that she's getting is not Instagram news, right? It's news that's coming from, you know, the CBC or the New York Times or or the AFP or whoever it is. So social media is really important. And one of the things that we're doing at Covering Climate Now in uh, 2024 is to really figure out how do we engage with um help our traditional media partners engage better with social media and also find the uh, platformers and the influencers out in social media who are interested in doing news and bringing them into to get them to climate journalism. You know, a lot of what's out there in social media is just basically about, you know, building up my uh, ability to make money as a as an influencer. But some are doing really serious journalism. There's a great piece in the Washington Post about this last week. So there's a lot of opportunity there. If you are somebody who is, is a social media influencer and you want to do more on climate, uh, please get in touch with Covering Climate Now. Okay. <laughs> it is. I can commend Covering Climate Now to everybody who might be watching this. Does anybody else have anything to say about this? I'm also wondering about the role of disinformation and misinformation through social media. Is that something that you see as a responsibility of a uh, climate journalist to be tackling? I mean, uh, it, it, it is. No, and, no, you just see so many good uh, projects around the world doing this. Um, I, want, I wonder the, the extent of like how, how much it works is just doing fact checking after the fact. I think there's, I've seen many good examples of like people actually going, you know, we're inoculating ahead of time and saying like, this is actually happening um, these are tactics that some actors might use to just try to deceive you. Mm -hmm. I think that is the best way for me to approach misinformation, not like going after the fact, but like trying to go like ahead of the game and, and try to put it out there. And just like on another point, like on broadly like solution journalism, I think it's just, I think we, this panel is about like journalism and solution journalism, but I think it's just one of the tools in the toolkit. And I wouldn't want to give the idea that this is just like the way of every journalism on climate change should, should go forward just because we just can't I mean, and we shouldn't it's just one of the one of the ways forward um but but, but ge generally we we just lack more of this in, in in our in our coverage okay i'm going to turn to some uh, audience questions now um the first question i've got is from trish and uh it's not uh we, we've sort of discussed this already but there's a part of it that i think some of you might want to address she asks what type of information are you looking for as journalists? Is there research out there that has gaps or subject areas that you are having trouble getting data about? Anyone want to jump on that? I don't feel that there's a lack of information now. Uh, we have a lot of information as journalists, and there's more coming all the time. 
um, the 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 obstacle is finding uh, ways to tell those stories. So, um, <clears throat> and sometimes the information that comes is not very audience friendly. So if you're trying to, I get the sense that the questioner wants to be of use here. So uh, that's great. And um, I would only urge you to try and deliver information that is able to reach a general public as opposed to something that is very narrow uh, or very obscure, uh, wonky kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that um, we, we have a some terrific data journalists uh, at the CBC, and one of them put her mind to uh, a data story over the summer that, that's had some impact. She got um, these heat and humidity sensors put in people's homes across the country, and they were recording the temperature and the humidity in the home 24 hours a day. And then she crunched all the numbers on her data and showed how many of these places where a lot of vulnerable people were living, elderly people, people with health conditions, the heat never went below temperatures that were anything less than putting them at risk. And she was able to use that data, data she created herself to be able to tell a really powerful story. Um, I, I do acknowledge though, I know um, from my own experience that sometimes it's very hard to get at that kind of data in Canada, that access to information isn't always the easiest thing to wrestle with in this country. So uh, if any of you have any ideas about if there are there gaps that people can try to go into and dig it out, uh, do you, any Diego or uh, Stephanie, any ideas about that? Anywhere you've tried to report and you came up against a brick wall? I think for, for me, the biggest data gap is geographic. If, if you go elsewhere, but not the US, Canada, and the Europe, it will be quite difficult to get quality data that is consistent as like, is like reaching far back in time. If, I mean, I remember from Bangladesh, like messages to us at the network today, asking how to get like quality data on like water, um, I think water quality in Bangladesh, in Dhaka. And it, it, it is, for me, the best way to just fill gaps is actually investing in weather, weather stations, in climate data outside of North America and, and, the, and Europe. And if you're funded as a way forward, if you're a journalist, try to like support reporters outside of um, North America and Europe and, and filling this actual, the biggest gaps in the world are just access to data in countries where you, have, you might have no, no FOIA request because you have a government that don't, don't really give it. Um, or just, you don't have enough with, with the stations, you don't have enough like climate collection points. I think tackling that bit is for me is the biggest issue on like um, data gaps. Yeah, Stephanie? Some, um, one in particular that comes to mind that comes up a lot is uh, in season like salmon numbers because we don't have a lot of like in season monitoring that you can really know exactly how many are coming back and that would just require a lot of upgrades to how to how we monitor in a lot of different places like so many different streams and everything. Um, and I think say there's some other ones. Just the most important thing to me is identifying and explaining those gaps and how that actually like can really impact um, policy and response to things like species at risk. Like I think just like really identifying where those gaps are and explaining to people like where they might think that there would be data, why there isn't, and what that gap means in our understanding and 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 our ability to respond. Um, another one that's kind of interesting is ecosystem services and the idea of trying to put a money value on nature um, as a way to try to garner support, but also like, you know, once again, highlighting the limitations and the issues with trying to apply any sort of like money value um, to something that just has intrinsic value that, you know, can never really be numbered. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating subject. They, they are trying to do that in some municipalities across Canada. Now, Annabella, um, I'm wondering if your outfit, um, if somebody could come to you and, and say, Listen, tell me what some underreported things are that we're we're not covering, and and you can provide that kind of resource or that kind of data that somebody would be able to pick up on that. Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to bring up. Is um, even for Diego, what you mentioned, like some other parts of the world where there's less information. I actually started my PhD in Argentina in Patagonia, and I had to look at climate data, and it was so spar uh, like sparse that. I had to rely on my team and ways that they had um, gathered climate data in the past. And we used like some of Chile's climate data. So if you can contact scientists working in the area, they probably have a lot of the data and can give you either 
the data itself or ways to find it because we struggle with that already in the work that we do um or even with like salmon or ecosystem services uh Laura, like you're, you're on point. Um, so many municipalities are starting to manage their natural assets and give them a price uh, or a number and putting them on their on their financial sheets because um, we're starting to see that they actually can, I mean, we know this, that they can reduce a lot of, of the climate change impacts that we're seeing. Um, so this work is already being done and universities and researchers and, and the National Research Council there are many people that are involved in all of this. Uh, so if you continue, which already journalism does such an excellent job of reaching out to the experts and the scientists and getting information from them, continue to reach out and you might get that information, that data gap uh, that you have in your story. And if I can jump in just with, <laughs> yeah, with, with a plug here, yeah. which is we have this, an issue, which is like, okay, and I'm gonna just, let's find scientists on this here in Syria, but it's also really hard to find the scientists if you just Google them um, because they're not always there. Mm -hmm. We like created last year something called the Global South Climate Database, along with mm -hmm. the Global Carbon Brief, which is a database of scientists in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and the Pacific. Which you can just look for like climate and health scientists and find ideas of people who are working the topic in Argentina, in Nigeria, in Bangladesh. So if you want to look for sources beyond your North America, you go for the Global South Climate Database on Google, and you you find like ideas there. That's a great point, and I've looked at that before. And the other thing that, that I would urge when you're looking for those um, people to talk to is is look for diverse sources of information, um, people who are coming from the de developing countries, um, people who we don't normally uh, feature on our... We're trying to really diversify the, the, the sources that we use and the people that we talk to, making a conscious effort to do that. And I think it makes our storytelling richer. So that is something that you should really... Um, Make a, I think you should make a priority of in your work. And the other thing I would say is that um, the, the federal scientists uh, working for Climate and Environment Canada or in other departments are more open to talking to journalists now than they were under the Harper regime. <laughs> so you can, they, you can approach them now and get information from them, maybe not an interview, but they'll sh certainly share information with you. So I think that that's certainly more of a resource than, there, than there's been in, in the past on that. Okay, um, <clears throat> Kanina asks, can you identify any news organization or reporter that is doing particularly innovative work on covering the climate crisis? Oh, Mark, you're smiling again. Are you going to say covering climate now? <laughs> Let's say the award winners. Covering Climate Now has given awards the last three years for the best climate journalism in the world, and we give a Climate Journalist of the Year award, and this year it went to three uh, journalists. One is Monka Bell of the Times of India, another is uh, Amy Westervelt of Drilled, and the third is Damien Carrington of The Guardian. And Damien, again, just today, has a uh, another great story out uh, showing that the fossil fuel industry is literally ready to to uh, drill for twice as much oil and gas as is compatible with the 1.5 degrees. So there's a lot of great work out there. Um, and again, come to our website. There's a lot of award winners uh, at the Covering Climate Now Journalism Awards vertical. Also, but Mark, the other word that the, the Kanina used was innovative. Yeah. Innovative. Yeah, uh, the most innovative thing uh, that I have seen probably on the climate beat, uh, you know, in years is what uh, public television in France has done, which is that they have dropped the uh, traditional weathercast out of their 8 p.m. Uh, national news. And those of you may not know, but in France, the 8 p.m. Uh, newscast is still kind of a national cultural institution where families do sit down and they watch the news together. France Television has dropped weathercasts and replaced them with a weather climate forecast. Uh, they call it a Meteo Climat Journal. And you can literally, they deliver the weather. You hear what the high and low temperatures are going to be for tomorrow and all that. But it's put into the context of climate change. And they have behind the presenter a, uh, an electronic counter that goes out to eight decimal points. And you can, that is measuring how much the Earth's uh, average global temperature is higher than the pre-industrial era. So you, the viewer, can literally watch global warming happening in real time. 
And then especially innovative is that they also include, a, and they have about three and a half minutes for this whole segment, they do about 90 seconds where they take a question from the audience and they have a pre-recorded answer to that question from a leading French scientist, uh, which turns out to be a great source of story ideas for those journalists because you really find out what the public wants to know about climate change rather than what we think the public should know. And the best part of the story is that uh, France Television is now winning the ratings race at that segment of the uh, APM broadcast since they innovated this in March of this year. It, it's it's that is interesting. the The only thing that that strikes me as um, challenging is that that uh, the idea of having that sort of appointment television, as you said, it, it doesn't really work in large parts of the world now. Attention is so fractured. You can't expect one audience to be there for that moment. So I guess the idea is to take the innovation and find new ways to fit it into different kinds of communication with people. I mean, I, we're certainly trying to be more innovative with our radio program and make it more as a podcast offering because we're trying to meet uh, listeners where they are now. Um, and that's part of our efforts at innovation. Does any, anyone else have any reporters or organizations that they would point to? Um, I would say in Paraguay, El Surtidor, which is a Paraguayan um, outlet that has been doing fantastic work with like visual, visual and graphical journalism, taking a, a, what Seven said, like, said, like just sort of like comic -y, funny journalism, but also like in-depth like investigations do a fantastic uh, job there. Um, I like what um, a reporter is doing at The Drum, which is a magazine focusing at in, in the ad industry, um, Ellen Ormisher, and she's covering the ad uh, the like industry on ads and climate change and how some companies are not like um, following or being enabled for like fossil fuel industry is it's really interesting. Uh, but also if you go to the Offshore Climate Journalism Network and go to our members, you have people doing all sorts of really cool stuff around the world. That could be, yeah, a good way to just get like different views and voices from all over the world. Annabella, do you, have you come across any particularly innovative work going on? Um, it's it's a very good question. I don't have anything right off off the top of my mind right now. I just know that there's like a lot all the time coming up, so I, I don't have a an exact answer. Yeah. Okay, Steph. Well, of course, I will still plug the narwhal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all of my colleagues that I look up to, um, and we have a solutions tag under the menu if you really want to dive into solution stories. But of course, I think there's so much that it's, I, I was going to also say to check out the Solutions Journalism Networks because it's like so many journalists at so many different places doing amazing work. And then um, the other thing I was going to mention to um, Grist in the United States, beautiful, beautiful work, like just visually stunning and really cool investigations. Um, and then at the TAI, they've done some of these like as told by stories which is very yeah. very yeah and then so my colleague Francesca wrote a beautiful um series called surviving in their own words and um people who have survived climate um ordeals telling their story in their own words and I think that that's a really cool direction for things to go as well okay we've got just a couple of minutes left and I'm going to give each of you a chance to say some some final words here of uh if I can get you to cooperate and give me about 30 seconds each Diego let's start with you every single beat is a climate beat you cover transport Climate beat, covered fashion, covered ads, you cover sports, you cover business, politics. If you won't do journalism of any sorts, you're doing climate, you can you can do climate journalism. Just find a way in which your industry either pollutes or has been affected by climate change and see who's doing something about that. Okay, Annabella. Just want to express my gratitude to journalists everywhere that are covering this topic, that are pushing this, that are looking at the solutions. A reminder that the solutions are out there. We have them. It's about finding them, uh, like Diego said, looking at the problem and then figuring out who's working on it and then promoting that. Um, but a major thank you just to everybody that's covering this. Uh, it's an enormous, enormous complex beast, uh, and we all need to work on it to get there. Stephanie. Highlight is one at the Narwhal, we're always thinking about complicating the narrative. It's not yes or no, or black and white or a binary, like just really highlighting the complexity of um, of every story and really keeping that front of mind. And then also, um, as I was kind of saying earlier, just the fact that when we do solution stories, it's not like we're like an operator, an operating table and doing something separate. Like 
um, the fact that humans are part of this ecosystem of this world. And I think that the biggest part of doing the solutions climate journalism is recognizing indigenous peoples around the world. And, you know, it does the solution include indigenous jurisdiction, um, okay. including that aspect in your reporting. It's also okay, so I'm going to cut you going to cut you off there because Mark, I know, has to go hard at the end of the clock. So I think you've got about 10 seconds, Mark. Go ahead. <laughs> We journalists, we get paid by our employers, but we work for the public. And in order for us to uh, continue to do that, we need your support. So please pay for your journalism and uh, use the, our journalism. Use our journalism to go out. And as they used to say here in San Francisco, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. Okay, good words to leave on. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. Thank you to the Canadian Journalism Foundation and thank you to our panel. Bye-bye.